Hi, Katrina. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Uh, hanging in there. Yeah, kind of challenging times uh, for the world and especially, uh, well, for people in Ukraine, but also for people who have a special interest in, in that part of the world, which you do. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. Uh, I'm also the publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. You are Katrina Vanden Heuvel. You're the editorial director of The Nation. Um, you're also a board member of the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord. Um, and you, uh, and, and we're going to talk about, about Russia and Ukraine. You've, you've had a longstanding interest in, uh, in Russian affairs. Um, and, you know, I want to, first of all, let me say, I, I think uh, I know enough about you to know that you and I agree on some things. I think we both think that there are things, uh, that America could have done over the past couple of decades to make uh, something like this tragedy less likely. I want to talk about that, but I, I also want to say, I, I, I know speaking for myself and probably for you, we don't uh, think that that absolves uh, Vladimir Putin uh, of responsibility for what's happened. It's a clear cut violation of international law. Um, uh, I, I say that just because, you know, especially when there there is, uh, you know, human suffering on this scale going on. You know, people sometimes have a, a low tolerance, understandably, for kind of clinical discussions about what other people, other than Putin, who is the, in legal terms, the criminal here, what other people might have done. Uh, but, but uh, so I wanted to I, clarify I, my I, own I view have, and, and go, go I ahead. I have a low threshold. I mean, I do have a low threshold. I think you take this uh, indefensible violation of law, international law on in its own terms, and you have to respect the, the criminal suffering we see as a result of that. And um, I also think there's room for humane outreach. There's room for analysis of how do we achieve a reasonable peace if possible. But uh, I was just part of a drafting process with Russian and American women. The Russian women have dropped off uh, for fear of their safety. But we issue today, not just Women's Day, because I believe every day is Women's Day, but a statement of, from a group of women speaking to uh, women and people addressing the bloodshed, seeking an end, mm -hmm. uh, and ceasefire and end to the nuclear dangers. And I think there's a role for that. Um, th there's a lot of human, um, you know, kind of vertigo right now. And I will say that even people like Ambassador Matlock, who was has- the Ambassador been, of the Soviet Union during the Reagan administration. And very important in the end years of the Soviet Union and speaking to a nuclear war must never be fought, can never be won, work closely with Reagan. He was shocked the evening we learned of Ukraine, the invasion. I think many people, saw what we saw, Bob, as a leveraging of troops, a leveraging of Russian power in order to better achieve some agreement, uh, which we can talk about. But there's been a lot of- You mean you, I, that had been your conception of it? Uh, as was, the yes, and Matlock and other, Anatole Levin was very surprised. Uh, the idea of perhaps Levin was even surprised by the recognition of the two republics in uh, Donbass. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying there was there's a lot of rethinking about not just Putin. I mean, I was on a radio show the other day and they said, is Putin crazy? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, is Trump, cra you know, that's that's easy. I think there are factors one has to think through. But there was a shock that uh, this move was made. So we can talk about it. I yeah. mean, I think people, yeah. I mean, I wasn't surprised by invasion. I was surprised by the scale and nature of the invasion. Um, uh, I mean, I certainly wasn't surprised by it after his Monday speech when people said he sounded, you know, very emotional, if not unhinged. Um, but uh, but I had I had thought for some time – 
that if we we uh, you know if we didn't offer Push. more than than we were offering him, there would be some kind of invasion, uh, if if only in the Donbass. Um, but uh, but I, I I think it's legitimate to ask in retrospect. Well, what what diplomatic offer actually would have done the trick? I mean, whether that question needs reappraising. I, and, and let me just ask you, not exactly that question to start off with, but uh, what do you think his calculation was? What do you think was going on um, in his yeah. head when he made this decision, which so far does not seem to be working Terrible out Terrible miscalculation. Well yeah. Terrible miscalculation, if one can, can use that sort of sterile word. Uh, I think it's a tragedy for Ukraine and a tragedy for Russia. I don't know how you... I think uh, going on in his head, um, always difficult, but I would trace it back a few years, but I'd also rely on the reporting by people like Fred Weir of the Christian Science Monitor, someone who's very uh, responsible, has been in Moscow for 40 years. The sense that Putin became increasingly disconnected from uh, forces around him, good and bad, but the pandemic did seem to breed some paranoia. We saw manifestations of it, those long, long tables, which we at first laughed at, but clearly had a purpose both of keeping him distance as a modern day czar, but also health reasons. The elite within the Kremlin and the corridors of the Kremlin seemed shell-shocked because the decision was held so closely too, it seems. I don't know if your listeners have seen the video of Putin dressing down his top team. I mean, it's like schoolboys sitting in their chairs and it's the lead intelligence official, it's the mayor of Moscow. And But it, there's a, there was a sense of a disconnect. And I think Putin listening to very few people not clear if they told him what he wanted to hear, that it could be quick, mm -hmm. fairly clean. Uh, if they told him that because he may have wanted to hear it. But um, I also think there were steps along the road that are more rational, that Zelensky at the Munich Security Conference about a week before the invasion spoke of the, Hungar the Budapest Memorandum, which was in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its weapons. Kazakhstan did as well, gave up its nukes. And Zelensky called to renege that deal as if he was calling on the West or calling simply on the fact that they wanted to reacquire nukes. And that triggered something in the Kremlin because they don't, they they didn't doubt it. I mean, they thought it was, so it's- it, when, when, it, when did Zelensky say that? So the Munich Security Conference, Bob, as you know, has played a right. wonderful, I mean, Putin in 1988, not in 2008, this was a week before, it was held a week before, about a week before the invasion. Okay. And people who were paying very close attention warned that this was a very bellicose speech. An appeal, as Zelensky now frames his audience to the West, to, you know, I mean, there's a case it reminds me very much, sadly, of Hungary in a different way, 56, where there were great demands on the West, which were not fulfilled, and there was a sense of betrayal, and you can feel that a little in the air right now. In any case, people fixed on that in the Kremlin, and it was not inconceivable. And so Zelensky was asking, was he asking for nuclear he, weapons, or did I misunderstand you? He Ask, was saying, asking to have the say, right to. Yeah, he was saying, we must renege on this agreement of 1994, because it's important that we reacquire. And I think you've seen, now how they would, I don't know, but the impulse, the, in, yeah. the demand, and you've seen articles in our good press, um, there's a lament sometimes that Ukraine gave up its nukes. Now, you know, the playing out of what that means if Ukraine had nukes. In, in any case, I do think, if you listen to Putin, and this is no brief for Putin, Last summer, he wrote an essay, which many thought was unhinged, about Ukraine and Russia being the same people, the same country. There has been an effort not to reconstitute the Soviet empire, but the Slavic empire, Belarus, Ukraine. I mean, that's the, 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 the mission. And of course, NATO moving closer. You had We had given $2 billion of weapons to Ukraine before all of this started. 
mm-hmm. their advisors. You know, so it maybe Putin looked out and said, "This is the moment that I don't. They'll never trust me. I'll never trust them." All this diplomacy. I mean, there was a glimmer of hope. I thought that there was a surge of diplomacy, and there was something on offer. You know, we can talk about that. It wasn't empty. Yeah, but it's so miscal. It's it's just. I suspect, as I said, people in the elite generally and people even closer inside the Kremlin appear to be shell-shocked based on observations by Russian and smart U.S. reporters. I, I think there is a fair amount of evidence that he did believe that the troops would be uh, – greeted with flowers as yeah. uh, this uh, former oligarch uh, who, who Putin put in jail and now lives in Europe put it. Uh, he, he thought that was Putin's frame of mind. I think there's a, there's a certain amount of evidence just based on the initial tactics of the invasion right. that they really thought they could just fly in and uh, into, into Kiev almost and, and inform the people that they had been liberated. And yeah. And, and, and I think that's consistent with the narrative, of course, that Putin wants to have, right? I mean, that, 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 uh, about, the, about the relationship of Russia to Ukraine and about the fact that everything he, he doesn't like about Ukrainian behavior is actually the result of external orchestration and, 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 and so on, right? It makes sense that he would. Terrible. No, you're, I, now, the fact that the East, which it is a divided country. It's a, it's been a, a civil war for five or six years between the West and the East. He was the, the invasion has prompted many in the East to return to their nationalist Ukrainian roots. I mean, it's been a terrible miscalculation. But you're right; there is an Iraq quality where we thought we would be welcomed mm-hmm. and greeted with flowers, and that takes a bureaucracy and elite pattern of informing and conversation that is not healthy to say the least but um he he did believe that the east would certainly rally and it hasn't and um zelensky has become a hero um and i think that um we haven't seen footage like this bob on our tv screens i can't remember and that has moved people right i mean people are just and there is the there is the also uh, in the interstices of the crisis, of the refugee crisis, we've seen some ugly parts where African students studying in Ukraine are not on the buses or taking off the trains. We have experienced warfare like this. This is brutal. But Iraq, Syria, it's just not, we haven't seen it. We've seen drones for for years. But we're seeing a European war, which on its own terms is stunning in 2022, Mm -hmm. a land war in Europe. Now, you just said uh, what was on offer diplomatically from the United States was not nothing. I I haven't been able to get clarity. By Putin's account, the most they had been offered in terms of NATO expansion was a temporary halt, a moratorium. Um, Do do you have details on what I totally, I think what you say is right, that there was a frustration that the U.S. would come in with talk about arms control, but the fundamental political divide that had to be addressed diplomatically was usually evaded, which was the issue of NATO. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, even though Biden and Putin met in Geneva months ago, and Lavrov, the foreign minister, and Blinken, our secretary of state, met a few times, that's not what I... um, meant when I said the real offer was this Minsk process that had started after Crimea in 2015, and it had Ukraine, Russia, Germany, France, in the, in, it was a process. And they- And, and to elaborate, it, it, let, tell me if I'm right about this, uh, it would have entailed, you know, these two, uh, well, what Putin now considers independent uh, republics, I guess, in the Donbass, um, the, the Minsk agreement would have kept them in Ukraine, but given them a kind of autonomy that I guess Kiev feared would give them veto power over things like future membership in NATO, which, of course, Putin would like. That was part of the idea. I don't know exactly what it would have meant in practical terms, but but 
But that's the key part, right? G- giving them a kind of autonomy that was that was meaningful. Uh, that was meaningful, and um, that gave them language rights, which are not to be minimized. I mean, that right. was part of the original Ukrainian leadership came in and banned the use of Russian in schools, et cetera. The main thing was something you talked to Ted uh, Tom Friedman about, which was the issue of neutral, that Ukraine would remain neutral. You could say non-aligned. There were models, as you know, there's you know Finland or there's Austria in 1954. There's a history of neutral countries, which are also democratic, market-driven, and um, that was at the center of it. But it was also Russia troops out, Donbass and Donbass become a part of a more federative structure. But it was Ukraine independent sovereign. There may have had to be monitoring, but it was um, it was a, and and you're right that NATO would be at best kind of there'd be a moratorium. The Russians have always come back to NATO, and I'm not sure the moratorium idea. But you know how cynical this is, Bob. You know this. It's absurd in a sense that Ukraine couldn't have joined NATO now. There was no impulse on the part of NATO members to bring Ukraine in. The territorial integrity and its financial situation would have mitigated against Mm -hmm. entrance into NATO. Um, I know it's, but I do think it became, when Putin gave the rambling speech, it was interesting, the order of his grievances, because he began with attacks on Lenin and I believe Stalin for their nationalities policy. And then he began about Ukraine, Russia, Belarus as a, only then did he turn to NATO. So. Yeah, he did. Though, you know, I, this deal, this deal was endorsed by the UN, by the EU. Uh, it never had much muscle behind it. Minsk, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. On that speech. Um, and again, you know, we're trying to put ourselves in his head just to understand what happened in hopes of maybe preventing things yeah. like this in the future and, and, and thinking about what might have been different and so on. This is not by way of sympathizing him. But, but the, I, I thought one thing that was interesting about that speech, um, I, I thought that the NATO part of that speech was interesting and it was more substantial than some people suggested. Uh, but a lot of that focused on his feeling that since we started sending weapons to Ukraine during the Trump administration, Ukraine has already become, in effect, a de facto out, out, outpost of NATO. NATO. Yeah. And th- that there are advisors there. There's collaboration. There are, he said, there are, quote, NATO missions that are, in effect, NATO bases. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how much of this is strictly accurate, but it, it clearly was his perception that there was an ongoing, growing, de facto yeah. presence of NATO with weapons and training and so on uh, in process and getting worse. It was. And, it, and see, I think that's, <clears throat> that's important. It was in process. They'd already shipped $2 billion. They had advisors in there. They had more and more NATO forces on the borders, and it was ramping up. And I think the idea that it was only going to get worse was something that may have triggered action as well. But you can see how quickly, I mean, there is this kind of Berlin airlift quality, but things are moving quickly to, in the sense that it was maybe some poised materials in the region. But the region was becoming increasingly on the borders, NATOized. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, the idea of spheres of influence it's both arcane and it shouldn't, I don't, you know, think it's the progressive stance, but it's real. Um, but I do think the sense that it was only going to grow and maybe this was the moment and the miscalculation about Ukraine and what the invasion would bring may have spurred, spurred. Um, and we can't forget, I mean, 27 million people um uh, died in a war, which is not that distant, and many families remember it. If there's any consensual history in Russia today, it's, Ma- it's Marshal uh, Zhukov is like the, <laughs> the a hero. 
So it's not an excuse. It's just trying to understand the different layers and different factors. I want to I want to get back to this question of things that over the years uh, yeah. may have kind of accumulated in his mind that maybe uh, led to this. Um, and when when we, when we do that, I want to talk about your late husband, Steve Cohen, who was one of the foremost experts on the Soviet Union and then Russia and who was very involved in in thinking about this for a long time, but why, why don't we uh, now jump to the present and, and maybe you can try to talk me out of my depression. But when I look at possible deals at this point um, and, you know, and ask, you know, like, like if you look at a Venn diagram and here are the things that seem realistically possible from Putin's point of view, in other words, negotiated solutions right now and kind of politically doable, uh, given his frame of mind. And here are the things that are politically doable or realistic from Zelensky's point of view, even without bringing America into the process, which I think is is probably the, the, the least problematic of the three perspectives in a certain sense right now. I don't see an intersection between what Zelensky would take right now and what Putin would take right now that could actually stop the hostilities. Maybe you can cheer me up. I don't see anything right now. In fact, I had this conversation yesterday with Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who's very wise, and Richard Falk, in terms of who might be an intermediary at this stage right now, someone to come in and be a mediator. The first thing that has to happen is ceasefire is actually uh, you know, upheld. We're not even seeing that. And you know, there are different intermediaries. There, uh, Richard Falk spoke about China and the UN. I think the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, now I may be dreaming on, could play a role in ceasefire, beginnings of some negotiation. But it is the case that the hatred of Russians in Ukraine and Zelensky's political base at this moment is to continue the war, to be the hero not to deny him the suffering he sees. And, and Putin isolated, likely to be meeting with um, issues at home as a result of this miscalculation. There's the protests in Russia are serious, especially the written ones from uh, elected officials around the country, the cultural elite. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mothers against the war when the body bags come back. Uh, there will be a movement similar to what hurt in Afghanistan. But I don't see at this moment except a third party trying to stop the bloodshed and the ceasefire. You could begin, but not right now. It's only been 13 days, I think, Bob. Isn't it two weeks? But you can't wait too long. But in the old Cold Wars, they weren't hot wars. Arms control treaties always were sort of compartmentalized. Um, but I do think a return to some process with a mediator. Mm -hmm. yeah. what's, what, what's the alternative? The alternative is more, the alternative, and we're all sort of waiting with hard, bated breath about Kiev. You know, I mean, is there going to be a move into Kiev? Yeah. This is going to be a shattered country. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone wins. Russia, Russia may occupy but who's going to rebuild this country? Who's going to rebuild the ties it has? It's it's well, and, it's, and how it's, well is the occupation going to go? I mean, no, this could, this know, could this turn into their concern. second Afghanistan. Afghanistan, and so this is not post world. This is not post World War II, you know, where you had the tension in Berlin, but it you know you had mechanisms. Uh, this is an if you occupy Ukraine, you confront an ongoing guerrilla war, which will be funded and possibly fought by people coming from abroad. They're I gather, already starting. Yeah. Um, so I think the to move, you know, this Minsk process is not a fan fantasy. They met, the team met during the mm -hmm. run up to this conflict in Europe three or four times for eight hours ago. And there was some muscle behind it, but I don't know, I ha I'm not someone who has studied after wars. But the hatred, how do you tamp down the hatred? How do you move mm -hmm. to a place where there's dialogue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just worry that Putin uh, at this point thinks, given how 
hard they have worked to secure control of of parts of um of the parts of Ukraine, especially around the Donbass and in between there and Crimea, that uh he just thinks that psychologically he probably can't come back and 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 say to his people, well, I just didn't get what I wanted. And and you know, we don't have regime change and we don't have this and we don't have that. And and I think that Zelensky uh, given the things he said, which is that he's not even going to acknowledge that Crimea is not part of Ukraine, much less, you know, so I, that that's uh, something on offer, though, yesterday evening. I don't I'm sure you saw it, but Russia's put forward. We won't give up Crimea. There is some reference to the republics, the two republics in Donbass. And we would seek to have in the Ukrainian constitution. No joining NATO. I mean, it's sort of like. A yeah. hard line on Minsk. Crimea is not going back. I mean, that yeah, that yeah. could be there could be a discussion of referendum. Uh, in addition, have right. maybe joint referendum around frozen conflicts. Right. Kosovo. Uh, you That's know, right. yeah, um, the. Uh, but NATO, as you can see, remains. A centerpiece in what they put forward. Oh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's. uh something he's going to hang on to till the end. I, I think one hope is that he'll realize that if he destroys Kiev, that's not a political victory. You know, I mean, the whole idea of this was that Kiev is the cradle of Russian civilization, right? I mean, uh, or at least a big part of it. And and, and this isn't like uh, disco- destroying, you know, uh, what is it, Grotsky and che- Chechnya or whatever the city is yeah, called, no, or Aleppo. People have compared that. This is not like that for him. No, and no. and you hope he would recognize that. Uh, what again, what will take? What will it take to lead him to recognize that? Is the question because we we've been talking about Putin. His circle has increasingly narrowed, mm-hmm. but it has been a mistake, it seems to me, on the U.S. side for many years to just say Putin, 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 because we've lost sight of the fact that there are other forces in the country. It's not a monolith, whether it's the Russian Orthodox Church, it's divided. The security groups are divided. Uh, At this point, however, you're in a crisis and how to move forward is increasingly narrowing the Mm -hmm. range. uh, No, but you mentioned, I mean, who is Putin? It's it's a tragedy and at this moment, He's, you know, viewed as it no brief for Putin, but Steve wrote a very important piece called Who is Putin and Who Putin is Not? And in 2000, when he came to power, his first act was to give Yeltsin and his family immunity from corruption trials. And when, when did your husband write this piece? Uh, seven, eight years ago. OK. And Putin was very pro-American when he came to power. He was the first foreign leader to call Bush after 9-11. He wanted to be part of the West. He had leader uh, advisors who were Westernizers. And they've been undermined and sabotaged in the last 20 years. So it's a much more hardcore nationalist grouping. Right. And so what was, the, what was the main takeaway from this piece, this assessment? I think the piece was the evolution of how the West viewed Putin. And he became, you know, the the thug who dominated all when he, you know, he came to power, saw a country that had imploded, collapsed twice, 1917, 1991. And he wasn't, it was Yeltsin who really kind of looted the country, de-democratized, shot a parliament, banned news. So Putin continued a de-democratization. Mm-hmm wave that Yeltsin had started, but he kind of put the country back on its feet. And he very much wanted to be part of the West. At one point, I think there was a question of could NATO, Russia join NATO? Bill asked Bill Clinton. Uh, increasingly, uh, the anti-Russian politics mounted. And uh, I would say, again, the Munich Security Conference, not to be fixed on this event, but in 2008, Putin spoke and I he think said, actually his his I think that was the 2007, but I but I yes, uh, I could be seven. wrong. And, yes. and, and then in 2008, George W. Bush gave a reply that wasn't exactly what he had in mind. But anyway, tell us about what Putin no, but said. 2007. You're right. Munich Security Conference. Everyone's gathered. Angela Merkel's in the front row with John McCain, and Putin essentially announced Russia's back. We're no longer on our knees. 
And at the height of the Iraq war, this is no longer a unipolar country. There are three poles, Russia, you know, and people freaked out because the belief was Russia was going to be on its knees for mm -hmm. a, a long, long time. And in that developed a kind of pushback and focused on Putin, but on Russia. And then 2008, of course, was the year Bush W. decided to fast track Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. That was when NATO made its pledge, basically, to eventually accept Ukraine yep. uh, as a member. And and I, I think in that 2007 speech, Putin, there are a couple of other things he said. Uh, he said, first of all, America is rampantly violating international law. The Iraq invasion, right. the Kosovo intervention, and I think both of those probably were violations of international law, unlike, say, the Bosnia intervention, which had Security Council authorization. Right. Right. And, uh, and of course, Kosovo is a real sore point with Russia. It drove Absolutely. Yeltsin nuts. Serbia, and, it's part of the Slavic. Right. And, and, and Putin said, you know, you, you, he, he, and he also mentioned NATO expansion yeah, as, as a threat. And he said, this can't go on. And, and at that point, Russia had not, in, in during his era, or even the post-Soviet era, committed the kinds of violations of international law that we're seeing now. Transporter aggression, except in self-defense, or with the Security Council's permission, is a violation of international law. The U.S. They, had, in fact, done that, as he noted. And at that point, Russia hadn't. And, had not. Then, and then Bush came back in 2008 and said, sorry, kid. Uh, you know, I know we, you know, nice try on NATO. We are going to bring Ukraine and Georgia yeah. in. It was after that that Putin started fooling around in Georgia with, a, a, you know, a military. By the way, the, the, I mean, not to get technical, but the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe did a good post-Georgia report about both sides violating and who prompted it. But you're right. That was a major speech. And it inflamed an already anti-Russian policy network. So you had the NATO crowd in action. You had John McCain and his team. You had weapons companies using his speech, in a sense, to jump and gin up uh, sales. And um, it became a view that Putin was a threat, a terrible threat. And I think that was a marker. Uh, and then, of course, along the road, you know, you've had um, you had Trump, Putin, where it became very difficult to raise questions or be skeptical about U.S. politics toward Russia, or you would be slurred as a Putin apologist. Um, and yeah, and then it became. It became Russia, it became a monolith. It was all Putin. And I wanna, Putin, yeah. Can I pick up on the Russia apologism thing? Because, yeah. um, by the way, you know who's having a hard time right now is John Mearsheimer. I mean, oh, he, I know. He, he says, you know, he spoke um, his mind at a, several places and he did an interview with The New Yorker. And, you know, Mearsheimer speaks his mind. The tone, the moment may have been difficult, but he is someone who's has a point of view, which we don't hear enough. I, I did want to say that um, one one thing that um, Steve and I shared a great um, we we shared an admiration for Gorbachev, who is often forgotten, but what he offered has been squandered. I mean, he had a different view. Talking about speeches, and you're right, Munich was 2007, but he gave a speech at the UN in 1987, which to this day is one of the most visionary about a common European home. And it was about an alternative to something like NATO, which is a militarized institution and the militarization of relations in Europe and the militarization of our approach to foreign policy is something that is a deeper, more serious issue as we try to engage a different world because all of these old blocks and these old institutions are being empowered as we sit here. Yeah. And of course, in the, in the nineties, uh, a number of people warned about NATO expansion, including George Kennan, including, uh, Jack Matlock, uh, Paul Nitsa. uh, yeah, <laughs> not, not exactly a dove. Uh, 
the, the, no, the um, one, thing, one thing that your interview with Friedman showed was there was a debate at the time about NATO expansion. Bill Bradley, Senator Bradley, Senator Hart, they were all, the, but there's no debate now on fundamental issues. Now, right now is not mm. a moment for, you know, I'm just saying. Right. No, even, been, even in the, in the, before the invasion, there, there wasn't much discussion about, well, what, what diplomatic overtures could we make? How far could we go? It, it, it basically wasn't being discussed. It was like everyone was applauding Biden for putting the screws on Putin and getting mm-hmm. Europe united behind the threat of sanctions and all that. And I was like, OK, but we do need an exit ramp now. You realize if it's all sticks, bad things could happen. And I don't know for sure what Biden offered, but I do know that you could look in the op-ed pages and turn on cable TV and you would hear almost no one even discussing whether we might actually offer them something. It was it was more weapons. Should it, The frame of it was, should we send more weapons? Um, how do we screw the screws tighter? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact, you know, there was not much talk about diplomacy. You wouldn't have heard about Minsk on TV, really. I mean, barely. Some of that, you know, Bob, is I think we we don't do diplomacy well. We don't know how to cover diplomacy well. And the uh, forces on our TV screen are often the very ones who are marinated in previous debacles from Libya, Iraq, Syria. And they're invested, literally invested in some companies, but they're invested in a framework and a policy that isn't going to permit a kind of diplomatic and whatever the word you use, sort of non-military, mm-hmm. it's very rare to see as uh, discussed. Now, let me. I, I want to. Um, I want to get back to uh, to Steve Cohen, your your late husband, and talk about the the 2013, 2014 time frame. Um, and this is again by way of doing something I've already done, which is go back and ask: Are there things that America did? That in retrospect, if we had had a clearer understanding of how they'd be received on the Russian side, we might not have done and might have made things like this less likely. And I know right now there are people who don't like this kind of thing because it seems like I'm shifting blame. Again, Putin is the one to blame for the invasion. Uh, I just have kind of an obsession with trying to make America better at uh, well, cognitive empathy. You, you've written yes, a yes. you've written a piece on strategic empathy. Strategic whatever empathy. term you want to use, it's just understanding how things are being processed. And I think one thing Americans still don't understand, by and large, they have now heard some things about NATO, and maybe uh, that that was to Russia. You know, putting NATO on their borders is kind of like Mexico entering a military alliance with China and start starting to bring in Chinese weapons and troops, which we might have a problem with. Um, but I think. The events of 2013, 2014, the Maidan revolution, we don't understand how that was processed in Russia. Most Americans have no idea what the American role in that was. Now, I remember in 2013 turning on the on the radio and hearing Steve say something I hadn't even been aware of. Uh, and this got no airplay. This, of course, was when Ukraine had a, you know, more or less pro-Russian president, not not entirely. Uh, but in any event, the prospect was on the table of Ukraine uh, not immediately becoming a member of the EU, but moving into some kind of associate membership or something, a kind of intermediate status. Um, and I hadn't heard before what Steve pointed out, which was, A, this would entail um, a severing of certain kinds of economic relationships with, with, uh, with Russia. It, there was going to have an, be an immediate downside for Russia's point of view, A. And B, Putin had suggested to the EU, can we work something out? Where, there, was where an they, offer, there was a tripartite on offer. That right. Ukraine would be between a bridge and EU and the Europe, Eurasian Association. And which, that was... A, which sounds like a great thing. If you strengthen economic ties between the West and Russia in effect, yeah. or at least maintain them via Ukraine. In principle, it sounds like a good idea. I, I gather the EU just just dismissed it. Dismissed it. There was also in the EU plan a small clause about military mm-hmm. in, in engaging with EU and a military clause, which 
But it was the tripartite on offer briefly that was dismissed if it was raised in this country's media. And it was essentially Ukraine as a bridge, as a buffer, as a non-aligned force. And that was dismissed very quickly. And then um, the idea that, you know, uh, he pulled away from the EU because of Russian pressure. You know, there was an assessment. You mean, you of mean the president of Ukraine? Yus, uh, Yushchenko. Yanukovych. Yanukovych. He assessed what yeah, he... the EU is going to offer. And let's not forget, we've seen countries, IMF, EU, there's often a, you know, cut in subsidies for food. There's this and that. And I think there was a general raw assessment of the problems of doing it. Now, there may have been great pressure from Russia, but so that breaks down. And then you have the protests and the Maidan demonstration is like almost every demonstration around the world, complicated. It's not simply pro-democracy reformers. It had and, those. And just to be clear, so Yanukovych had for a time seemed to be sympathetic to the EU relationship. And when he broke that off, it triggered a kind the, of the the the, the protest. protest by people who wanted the EU. There were pro-democracy reformers who less than wanting, they didn't really want the EU as much as they saw the EU as a way to minimize, get rid of the terrible corruption mm -hmm. that afflicted Ukraine. They were sort of anti-corruption, pro-democracy protesters. But there were other forces there. There were these right-wing extremist forces, some possibly brought by not Yanukovych, but these extreme right forces had snipers and there was there was bloodshed and the bloodshed was fully blamed on the government when it was a more complex story. And you celebrate those in the square who wanted anti-corruption measures and all of that, but it was a more complex fight. And then, of course, it devolves into getting the president out of there. He's deeply corrupt, elected. And so there was a decision Obama participated that there would be a special election months later. But he was driven out and the U.S. played, you know, the, the, there's a the famous call, Victoria Nuland, who I think, you know, she's become everything. I think she played a role, but she's but she was handing out cookies and she's taped. She, on she a was call. in the U.S. State Department and she had this phone call. Uh, she had a phone call with it, another, the ambassador to with the U.S. Ambassador, ambassador to Ukraine. Ukraine. Apparently and the it, Russians yes. taped it. There's a people can go. And Read find it. A transcript. And I was I was on a radio show the other day, and I said she said f u you know you when when the she said f u c k the e u, basically asserting that the U S was going to make a decision here. I got in trouble on the radio show because I guess you're not even supposed to spell it. I said it wasn't my word. Um, <laughs> so the involvement of the U S. It's not new. You know this, Robert. I mean, they in 2004, Richard Holbrook, former State Department official. And McCain and others came to Ukraine and slept in the square as there was an attempt to do regime change. Now, this didn't play well uh, in Moscow, as you can imagine, the, you know, changes in Ukraine. Yeah. That is when Russia came into Crimea. And that is a contested story. Crimea did belong to Russia. Khrushchev, I believe, in 54, 55, gave it as a drunken birthday present back to Ukraine. So this is it, within the Soviet Union uh, until Khrushchev, Crimea had not been you, part yeah. of Ukraine. And, and then and then he made he it part it, of the Ukrainian Republic. He was from Ukraine, by the way, not he perhaps was, not coincidentally. Yeah. There were Brezhnev um, was happy, right? Um, but but, but, no, uh, but Crimea has a has the warm water port of Sevastopol. It played an enormous role in World War II. And there was fear that NATO was moving toward taking it, seizing it. Right. In the context of this crisis and uprising, right. right? Russia possessed it by virtue of a of a very long lease with Pre Ukraine, lease. and I suspect that Putin thought, "Wait a second, you know, uh, let's let's go back a little to that Victoria Newland conversation." I think he is genuinely of the view that 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 the transition of power, a democratically elected president of Ukraine, was you know fled for fear of his life. Yes. With, with armed opponents roaming the streets. And I think Putin is sincerely of the view that that was a Western-backed coup. Yes. And what he would point to, that conversation, I encourage people to go listen to it. I think all that's available is fragments, and I suspect Russia did the editing fine. 
But what you hear is really striking. They about she, being pro-consul, like we are the government in Ukraine. You know? Well, they're, listen, they are deciding who, so, after the president leaves, right? And, we'll and be, maybe at that point they're planning an, an orderly succession or something more orderly than there was. But the point is, two Americans are deciding who should head the government after the president leaves. That's right. And and and. and they 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 talk about the pros and cons of these various people. They finally say, "I think Yats is our guy." Yeah, yeah. And then they say, "So how are we going to make this happen?" Well, we need to bring in an international figure. There's some kind of reference to Biden coming in and giving somebody an attaboy or something. Biden was vice president at that time, but there's no. And, and I think they. It's not like they know they can do it. But I think they almost say, "You know, this is maybe this is going to be tough, but maybe it, it's like there's no self. There's no kind of." That we are deciding the future and fate of another it is, country. I found and it amazing. Cognitive empathy. Imagine, you know, if you're in what you have to stand, I won't say, you know, Putin, but in a Russian leader's shoes to look at that and think right. they're remaking a country that actually, right. as pro consul of Ukraine, they've come in and rewired. And then, and then the final thing is the guy they selected did become prime minister. Yeah. Okay, so if you're Putin and you're thinking like, whoa, uh, this was a U.S. sponsored coup and I've got a very important naval base in Crimea that's dependent on Kiev honoring a lease, honoring a treaty. Um, again, I'm not excusing anything, but I know it's important to understand it's not about condoning. It's about understand, understanding for the sake of not repeating. Of right. history, right. of of telling a history that guides, as opposed to, you know, right. is mythic, and I think it does help explain more and more. Um, it is, you know, Biden once said that he um, he was considered the proconsul, you know, in in Ukraine, and he said once said as a joke that he spent more time on the phone with Poroshenko than his wife. But part, part, you know, Ukraine, I know this sounds odd. It's a much smaller country, but per capita, it's a more corrupt country in some ways uh, it, than Russia, because Russia at least had a break on the oligarchs. They've recreated a new generation of them. But Ukraine has been 24 years of just unmitigated corruption. And the oligarchs are very powerful there. Anyway, they played a role in the. But how Ukraine arose to be what we sit here talking about. And I mean that in across the board, right? I mean, how it's led, that's an issue too, because it's also how the Soviet Union ended, which is an interesting discussion. I mean, there were, Steve did a two page paper laying out the 10, he studied all the literature, the 10 reasons why the Soviet Union ended. He ended with a framework he never really liked, which was about men. Yeltsin comes on the scene with a will to power, Gorbachev a will to reform, the clash, and do you know that the Soviet Union was abolished in a treaty signed in the Bielovesh Belarus forest, signed by the leaders of Russia, Yeltsin, Ukraine, and Belarus? Really? I mean, this is, and so in that, you have the, again, that Slavic Union. Right. And um, it Ukraine played an important role from then on. So, so um, I don't, you know, but it's, um, Steve's book, published in 1918, is 2018, is called uh, "War with Russia?" Question mark. And in it, you know, he lays out to read it. It's painfully prescient, the possibility. Um, and he talks, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But yeah, the, uh, you know, you mentioned the oligarchs. Uh, I think. Um... One thing Putin, I gather, has done in Russia is make the oligarchs at least somewhat less powerful than they were in the Yeltsin era. Um, and 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 I'm I'm not sure if some people aren't overestimating uh, the power of putting the screws on the oligarchs. It, you know, if your goal is to ultimately instigate some kind of palace coup or something, I'm I'm sure it's not nothing. I'm sure I'm sure a, a ton of highly dissatisfied oligarchs increases the chances oh, yeah. of a palace coup but do you have any insight because honestly 
if you ask me, you know, I, I think a, a palace coup is a triple bank shock. You know, there are people who say, well, all these sanctions and 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 uh, providing, you know, and, and continuing to provide more and more support uh, for Ukraine could lead to a palace coup. I certainly hope so. I, I'm not I'm not persuaded. At the same time, I do think that's probably the only way, certainly for a fundamental reset of Russia, Western relations. I don't mean they're going to bring a Democrat to power in Russia. That's not the hope. It's, the hope is just that uh, you would have a leader who wasn't uh, politically invested into all the positions and tensions. That- well, I think that's it's a very important question. Um, here's one. Here's here's a kind of back ending into, you know, you've read. Uh, is it? I always get him confused. Nick Burns, Bill Burns, the CIA head, who no. uh, in his book he wrote about. Understanding in 2018, I believe, that NATO opposition, opposition to NATO was widespread across the spectrum inside the Russian political scene. I, well, it, he wrote one memo to that effect in 2008, eight, the same eight, year that Bush, and I think expanded. the memo, he wrote the memo to Condoleezza Rice, okay? Yeah. He was, I think Burns was in the Bush administration, wrote the memo yeah. saying, look, Ukraine in NATO is a red line, not just for Putin, but for all Russian national security elites. And And I think that has to be understood. Uh, Yeltsin was opposed to it in his special way. I mean, it was it was across the spectrum. What I mean is. um, If Putin, first of all. I'm sure there is rumble, but Putin would probably seek it's ironic what he did for Yeltsin. He'd find want someone to do that for him. Mm-hmm. Safe passage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not fully clear if the forces which would replace Putin would be less committed to what whatever program we can glean from speeches, et cetera, of Putin in this last period. It has it has been wiping out the Westernizers, those who really sought better U.S.-Russian relations. It has strengthened and empowered, as it does in this country, the hawks, the hardliners. Now, you might have a military troika. It might be more stable, but you're not going to get Navalny and you're not going to get a small D Democrat. Not now, maybe. In, but so I, I think maybe I'm wrong, but. I do think that the demonization of Putin is so powerful that maybe just not having Putin could lead to some more reasonable engagement. Mm -hmm. And certainly as a result of Ukraine, which has become Putin's war. Yeah. So but I, I, I think the forces inside and I'm sad to see though many of them are Russian polls, you know, 70 percent support. I mean, what you see on the streets of cities. For, you mean protests. for the war or for Putin during the war, for one or the other? I, 70% yeah. for the war, rallying around. You know, most Russians don't. There's a phrase, my Russian friend who runs an independent newspaper, which is holding on, Novaya Gazeta, says it's sort of people who watch TV and people who read the Internet. And many people don't have the Internet. And state TV remains very powerful. So... Um, so there's a rallying around, and um, it's important that there's protest, not just in the streets, but other. But it's a tough, it's it's a tough, you, you know how it is. I mean, we didn't rally around. I mean, we were good citizens, but Iraq, but people rally around it in times of war. Yeah, they do. And now the uh, the media landscape, is uh, even more restricted in Russia. Their their response, I guess, to the sanctions has been to shut down, you know, uh, relatively uh, relatively liberal open outlets. Um, and and you're right. I think older people and rural people in Russia are uh, are largely captives of TV, and not the they're not on the internet. And anyway, the internet uh, Russia is getting more and more restrictive about. So, By the way, yeah. So it's it's met, it's means of information, but I do think um, we've you know this is we have to keep pushing for it because it's going to be a battle to the last Ukrainian if it ends up being a guerrilla insurgency. I mean that's horrific too, mm-hmm. and it's so 
the loss of you know so, um i don't i don't see yet the mediating force i don't see the mediating group that could actually begin and it's been such a brutal war in such a short time that people the rawness and then talking about here you know this is minor but you know culture and the arts have often been a way to engage in bad times the boycotts are serious and i have mixed feelings about the boycotts because there won't be channels and then you have in the house of representatives almost every congressperson is trying to be tougher than tough so there's proposals to expel russian students expo uh, proposals to end sister cities citizen exchange not that it would happen right now and proposals to um oust the U uh, russia from the un yeah i certainly understand the impulse to want to uh to punish putin it was again clear cut violation of international law uh of an egregious kind you know i worry uh in general i'm i'm i've been an anti sanctions person because if you look at where we've tried them right. it, often with the, with regime change in mind they pretty much never work you know cuba venezuela S syria iran you, and they you, hurt you, ordinary you, people oh, you inflict massive suffering on people and and uh and then they don't they don't get the job done but uh, politically, you know, American leaders seem to think that they can't abandon them for reasons I don't totally understand. I don't think it hurts Biden's reelection prospects to take sanctions off of Venezuela, say. But uh, uh, so, say I, so I worry. Um, uh, you know, uh, this, these are the most I think this is these are the most far reaching sanctions the world oh. has seen. And what it means for the global economy for people is still unclear. But these are tough, you know, your listeners, you, you will remember the Jackson Vanek sanctions, which were put on, I think, in the mid-70s. Yeah. They didn't come off until a few years ago. Yeah. When things had, in terms of uh, Russian Jews being able to leave the country and emigrate. So sanctions, as we've seen with Cuba, with others, can stay on for a long time. But these are, and by the way, I don't think the oligarchs are going to be hurt that much. Uh, they have sanctions, sanctioned safe space inside Russia. They have, it, and by the way, you cannot have the scale and class of oligarchs without an enabling Western set of institutions. Oh, sure. So that's going to be, yeah. I mean, I, I don't weep for the oligarchs. In fact, I think Pandora's Papers, the investigative project on global oligarchs was important. Right. And, no, I mean, oligarchs, like everyone, hates, they hate to lose money, but, you know, it doesn't take long for them to realize that actually a person can get by on only $3 billion in assets instead of 12 or whatever, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, I, you know, I think you and I remember the Cold War clearly. I doubt, I don't think technology permits quite the degree of separation that there was yeah. then. But geez, it was like Russia was another planet. I know. And, and and I just and there was so little collaboration for a long time. Finally, some on arms control. But I just think the planet's at a point where we can't afford to go another 20 years without uh, global cooperation, not just on climate change, although on that, but on all and kinds nuclear. of nuclear, nuclear biological nuclear. weapons, new kinds of arms control issues, weapons in space, cyber, cyber. I just don't. Uh, no, I agree. But, you know, the whole arms control infrastructure has been decimated. It began. I mean, it began in 2002 with John Bolton and George W. Right. They got rid of the ABM treaty, which was the foundational. And every treaty is sort of either and Trump, the intermediate nuclear treaty. And again, these are things that got that Russia's attention. Of, yeah. In the worst of the previous Cold War, I'm, I'm friendly with Marshall Shulman's widow. I don't know if you remember, he worked with Vance and it was Vance versus Brzezinski. In bad times, they would do some arms control. But I don't know, you know, the, the rules, the rules seem unclear right now. You know, the... Um, the rules of the road, so to speak, um, and it's uncharted terrain, but it mm -hmm. is charted. There are, we can't deny there's been a history of Cold Wars, but this is uh, of a kind that is 
especially tough to think through a way forward. Yeah. I wish we could end on a more inspiring note. Um, I, I would simply would say people should not lose sight of the refugees and the, hum you know, we've just left Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of what, five trillion, six trillion, and the need for five billion to help humanitarian crises isn't being found. So, you know, Putin in an interview in Time magazine, I think it was Stephen Sestanovich, 2007, said he would never consider invading Ukraine because the costs, and you know, I don't know if you meant human costs, but the costs of paying pensions, the costs of taking over a country. Now, you, that's where you see a Putin evolve into a man who would, leader who would invade Ukraine, but he wasn't there then. So it's kind of a, but it is. I, a, I, think, it, I, I do think 2008 was a watershed when we promised, uh, I don't want to oversimplify, but when but it was promised, a kind of marker. You, yeah. There are markers along the, and the evolution of someone. It's not. It's. It's. Um, but I do think the humanitarian piece and um, and doing as much as possible not to um, what's contribute to a kind of not needed jingoistic, yeah. reflexive. Um, Obviously, people are very pro-Ukrainian right now, but I would say anti-Russian. There are good people who are protesting and who don't want this war. Absolutely. Uh, and remember, you know, as you think about policy options, these are two massively armed nuclear powers. Yeah. Uh, it would. Uh, and so uh, things like, say, a no-fly zone that clearly threaten to bring uh, direct engagement uh, between between NATO and Russia and and hence a regional war and possibly worse um, are I think uh, quite quite ill advised. Um, but that's just me. But so, thank you for having me on. Thank, thank you, you Katrina. For... This has uh, been been so interesting. Where uh, so people uh, they should check out Acura, the American Committee for U.S. American Russia Committee Accord. For East Accord. Your people Twitter... like Anatole Levin are part of it, and it's been a it's been a good. It's really about dialogue. We have a site, um, and we have alternative readings every day. So um, come to the site, and also the Nation dot com. Of course, yes. It. Which has and, been, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think a, a constructive voice on foreign policy for a long time. Well, you were part of a special issue, so I would agree that we've been concerned. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I was part of the New Republic, uh, which stands in contrast to that, which I was part of. I know uh, you were. Uh, I, I, no, I, but I, it is time for new thinking. But it's made far more difficult by this, you know, the new thinking about militarization of foreign policy not being where we should be it's very hard at a time when we see such military might but look at how i uh, again i come back to gorbachev his people should read his speech of 1987 at the un and um he was you know he was the first nuclear abolitionist to hold high power yeah. and that meeting with reagan i think they came and took Reagan out as quickly as they could because they were in Reykjavik discussing abolition of nuclear weapons. Right, tonight. right. Somebody said, let's get this guy on a leash. Um, <laughs> the uh, And where, uh, what is your Twitter handle? Where can people uh, find you? Oh my God. Yeah, I tweet all the time and this is pathetic. I think it's, uh, I'm going to give it to you now. Well, I'll tell people while you're talking that mine is Robert Ryder and I published the Non-Zero newsletter where I write about stuff like this. and. Uh, to keep you further entertained while Katrina it's Katrina Nation. Nation. Katrina Nation. One word, no underscore. No underscore, Katrina Nation. And okay. we are re we are reissuing um Steve's book um in April. And right. um called um Steve Cohen's book. And um we continue to um you know try to bring sanity, humane, humane common sense. Mm -hmm. I, I hope we can find a reasonable, a reasonable piece. It's going to be hard. Yeah, there's also Steve's classic historical book. What is it? Uh, Buk is it Bukharan? It's a, a, a Bukharan. It's a, it's a great, it's Bukharan, a political biography. 
-hmm. And it really is an insight into the history of the Soviet Union, but it's relevant for today in terms of what could have been where it's gone. And Steve was always a believer in alternatives. Mm -hmm. He also liked to quote Will Rogers, the great humorist. Oh, good. Maybe this will leave us on a positive note. He once said, "Is you can say anything about Russia, and people believe it." This was 1920s. Oh. Uh, but his he was the most famous humorist in America. Sadly, um, you know, it's um, Russia. Russia often gives us a lot to work with. Like but I hope I hope for rebuilding June. I'm going to end on an upbeat note. June 12th. 1982, a million people gathered in Central Park to op- oppose the INF Treaty. And a few years later, because of, I think, those protests around the world and in uh, New York, uh, Gorbachev, and if you can believe it, Reagan, abolished an entire class of nuclear weapons. And the INF now is lapsed, so that needs to be revived. But there was motion to begin to think hard they, about They gathered nuclear. to support the treaty? to. They gathered to support the okay. beginning UN convention gathering on disarmament, and they okay. supported the abolition of a class of nuclear weapons. I see. And they were in support of the INF Treaty, yeah. which, so I think that's hopeful. I do think more people are aware of the nuclear threat than have been in many, many moons, because I, I think at the end of the Soviet Union, there was an end to the fear of nukes, except for Trump, which brought it back, finger on the button. But now people, really have a sense of. And so the question is, it's always like, you know, more modernization, more weapons, or can we think about Mm -hmm. reducing the threat? Yeah. Well, uh, they are a good thing to keep in mind, you know, and there is hope. There were, there were times when the cold war seemed like it would never end. Um, Things can change fast. And, and I uh, mean, think of this 12 days. This past 12, 12 days? days? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's... Anyway, so very good talking to you. And um, Same here. May your dogs be okay or your dog be okay. <laughs> well, yeah, they look okay. 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 Thank, thanks so much, Katrina.